Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. Super excited to be here with my guest, Lindsay Mitchell, today from my vital side. Lindsay, how are you, my friend? What is going on? I am doing very well, you know, just uh, enjoying life here in Austin and, uh, you know, feeling good. Good. I'm, I'm glad you're feeling good. That's that's such a great way to think about the world, especially in the state of how things are today. Um, before we get started and dive in, um, for those who do not know, tell us a little bit about you, your story, when, what kind of brought you to where you are today. Sure. So I am the founder of Vital Side, which is a virtual brain retraining platform. So I work with people who have chronic illness and chronic symptoms, symptoms like anxiety, fatigue, brain fog, and then chronic diseases like fibromyalgia, chronic pain, chronic fatigue syndrome. And what I do specifically is help people to regulate their autonomic nervous system, or maybe you've heard of the fight or flight response, which can often be something that people experience when they're going through a chronic condition or they have chronic symptoms. So I got really interested in this specific niche of medicine after going through my own uh, illness. You know, I, I had chronic Lyme disease. And before that, I was working as a physician assistant in internal medicine. So I was trained in Western medicine. I am trained in Western medicine. And I was working as a travel PA, traveling all over the world, treating really rural populations and ended up getting bitten by a tick and contracting Lyme disease. So within a year, I went from being super active, traveling, very independent to basically bedridden for a couple of months, chronic pain, fatigue, anxiety, sensitivities to food and chemicals, migraines every day, and couldn't work had to have my family move next door to me. My husband had to take a job working from home so he could take care of me. So my whole world changed. And that experience really gave me a new perspective on living life with a chronic illness and what that meant and how that really changed things for me. So I at the time, sought every avenue to figure out what the hell can I do, right? What What is something that I can uh, change in my lifestyle, you know, add to my treatment plan in order to see changes to my life? And I, I sought so many different treatments and I started with the Western root of medicine. And then I quickly had to expand my uh, really perspective on what medical treatment looked like and tried many, many different avenues and detox and treatment. And, and what I did was I came across this idea of how the brain changes, this concept of neuroplasticity, which basically just means the brain can change. And I learned more about it that when you have a chronic illness, your brain changes. So it's operating from this fight or flight response, this sympathetic response, day in and day out, basically communicating, hey, danger is present, you need to respond. And the body responds with inflammation, pain, basically survival in your body. And when I, I came across this on a blog post, and when I was reading about it, I was like, okay, this makes so much sense because I have tried so many things and I have detoxed and I have treated the bacteria, but I'm still sick and symptomatic. And that's where I went down this deep dive into, okay, let me calm this fight or flight response, dictate a new reality, a new signal to my brain so that my body can respond. And that's exactly what I did. And I tried every program out there that's offered I read books, I you know, read everything by Dr. Joe Dispenza, I studied the research by Dr. Candice Pert, Molecules of Emotion. I started to really learn about this brain and body connection. 
And within that year period, I did end up making a full recovery from Lyme disease. And I went from being bedridden, not being able to lift my hand, my arm up to feed myself to eight months later, back to doing headstands and eating the foods I wanted to eat, eating gluten and dairy without uh, a bloating or inflammatory reaction, being able to travel again. And that's just when I <laughs> realized like, this is incredible and more people and more medical practitioners really need to start implementing the brain's natural healing properties into treatment plans. And so that was kind of my goal after I did make that recovery. So that's what I did. I Googled how to start a business. Uh, I became trained in neuro-linguistic programming and the emotional freedom technique. And I started VitalSide and that was about five years ago. I love it. And that that's quite the story. Um, you know, I, I have my own experiences through coming through chronic illness. I had asthma as a child, had massive, terrible, debilitating migraines as a child. Um, by the time that I was in my, my mid twenties, I developed SIBO. I got C diff. I've had E. Coli. I, you know, the list goes on and on. Then I had, I, I got diagnosed with POTS, posterior tachycardia. The list goes on. I was from 26 to 30, I went to over 45 doctors and spent probably uh, well into the six figures on my medical expenses and needs. And one of the things that happened that was really fascinating in my journey was coming across the research and literature around the ACE survey and how adverse childhood experiences and development in the cortisol state, really, which happens for a lot of people who come through trauma, and that's whether it's trauma as a child or trauma as an adult, it all kind of leads down this same pathway where suddenly you're in your sympathetic nervous system, the fight, fight, please, freeze or fawn response, and your brain is only trying to do one thing, survive. So how do you heal the body when the brain is only focused and the body is only focused on what autonomic functions must be present for survival? And when I learned this, I started understanding and I got deep into this process of yoga, meditation, journaling, NLP, a lot of the same things that you're talking about. I started to see this profound change in my life. And it's not that there wasn't a benefit to Western medicine, because I think that there is to some extent. Um, but often the solution when we are faced with things that I would dare, dare call a death sentence, like Lyme's disease, like E. coli, things of this nature, people just kind of go, all right, well, hope you enjoyed life up to this point. Godspeed. What started, how do I want to phrase this? We have the opportunity, even though we go through these very terrible emotional, physical ailments, right? Because I, I would argue that the illness is more emotional than it is physical at times, debilitating, painful, you know, things of this nature. What was really the precursor and the catalyst for you deciding to take back your life by learning, by getting educated, by trying literally what it sounds like everything? What was that like for you? I think that stems back to a core belief that I developed in childhood that I am strong and I need to advocate for myself. And I know a lot of times we hear about core beliefs and a lot of times they can be negative core beliefs, right? I am not enough. I, I don't deserve healing. All of these things that we can kind of be stuck with. And of course, I have my fair share of those that I've had to learn and address over the years. But this was a core belief that really helped me and guided me throughout the process. So I remember, you know, during some of my deepest, darkest moments, uh, you know, a point where if, if you've had Lyme disease or you've had like a parasitic infection, they can be similar in, in the fact that you can have hallucinations. And I was having one. And if you've ever experienced a hallucination, you just, it's like, you're not yourself. You're somebody totally different and it's horrifying. And <laughs> I remember experiencing that. I'd never experienced anything like it. And I was lying on the ground and I was crying and I was like, I just want to die. Like, this is horrible. I'm not myself. 
you know, and looking back, I'm like, okay, that was my nervous system. That was like my limbic system in overdrive, the emotional uh, feeling reacting brain, just firing and firing and firing, surviving, right? And I was like, I don't think I can survive this. And I remember having a moment where I thought, this can't be it. <laughs> this can't be all that there is. And I think that core belief of I am strong and I am my advocate, it did shine through even in that moment. Like that was probably the worst moment of despair. I just very, uh, very vividly remember lying on the ground and what that felt like. That shone through even though I didn't feel it, even though I didn't really believe it it was there. And then th the fact that I became aware of it made me realize in other situations when that core belief came out. So then I, I went to see a therapist who told me, oh, your story is the worst story. This was an 80 year old therapist. And she said, your story is the worst story I've ever heard just with your childhood trauma and um, dealing with this chronic disease. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, it can't be. <laughs> I was like, there's no way this is the worst story she's ever heard. I want to prove her wrong. I'm strong and I'm my advocate. And I would go see practitioners and they would say, oh, you know, just like you probably experienced, Michael, of, of going through POTS and E. coli and, and these types of conditions, you know, my practitioners, most of them that I saw would say something along the lines of, well, you're just going to have to make yourself comfortable uh, and live with this for the rest of your life. And that core belief that was there was like, no, no, I am not. I'm going to prove you wrong. And that was my motivator for change, my catalyst for change of, I want to prove these people wrong, who supposedly they know best, right? No, I know best. I have healing properties within me. I believe in my body and I believe in my immune system. And luckily, that neural pathway in my brain related to strength and resilience was strong despite my circumstances, my internal environment, my body, my external environment, what was going on around me, that neural pathway was still strong. And that just strengthened and strengthened and strengthened. And when I read about neuroplasticity and I learned that we can retrain our brains to basically communicate a signal of resilience, a signal of health, through accessing our natural resilience, which is our parasympathetic rest and digest or growth and repair response. And when we operate from that response more often than not, and our autonomic nervous system responses are balanced, that fight flight response, that freeze response, that fawn response, that um, growth and repair response, when we can kind of easily bounce back between all of those responses, that's when we start to feel better. Blood flow gets sent to our GI tract to digest food. You know, we actually communicate through our cells and through our genetic expression a new way of being. We actually can change the way our genes expressed through releasing feel good neurochemicals like dopamine when we laugh or oxytocin when we give somebody a hug or we give to somebody in need. So those are very, you know, small tangible examples of how we can change our neurochemistry to help us to feel better and to even shift our health and put focus on, on our immune systems. And so when I read about this, I had learned about it in PA school, a, a very kind of small snippet of what I know now. But it was so empowering to me. And at that point, after dealing with this condition for a year, I was like, I need something empowering. I have outsourced so much of my, my ability to heal on external resources, right? Other practitioners, other people, other things, supplements even, other tools that may help a little bit and may have got me gotten me to a place where I could use these neuroplastic tools, 
but I was so tired of outsourcing my healing. I wanted at that point to tap into my natural resilience. And to me, learning about brain retraining was really empowering because it followed that same trajectory of one of my favorite neural pathways, one of my favorite core beliefs of I am strong and I am my own advocate. I love that. And and I think that we do have to be our own advocate. You know, I, I recall just countless conversations with doctors where they were just like, just do this prescription, just do this prescription, just do this. And I was like, there's got to be another way. There has to, and like, call it my stubbornness, right? Which has been a trait that I acknowledge well, well, many times in my life being the the catalyst and the precursor for me taking control and being the advocate for my own health. And if not been for that, I don't know that I would be almost 10 years removed from initially getting sick and being on no prescriptions and having no, and it's not that like I don't have flare ups and, and pain sometimes and things like that, but I do have the ability to just calm my nervous system. Cause I notice like you're, you know, if you've ever read, which I'm, I'm assuming you have, the body keeps the score. You can look at so much research that points to and indicates the fact that our body stores our emotions, our traumas, our experiences, our pain, our suffering, our hope, our joy, our happiness, like whatever that thing is. It's why you feel giddy and lit up like on, on a date or with your, with a partner that you love and care about, or the same reason why your stomach hurts really bad when you know that you've made a mistake or that you're in trouble, or if you are super anxious, you know, your body is such a beautiful indicator for what is actually happening because I thought about this a lot your brain and your body are not interchangeable. They are connected. You are a human being because the two of these things work in synchronicity, though it's dispelled that somehow they're, they're separate. I don't agree with that. So thinking about that and understanding that, what do you think is the best way for somebody to really like listen to their body, understand the indicators of, is there something going on um, and how to honor that in their journey? Because I found myself, I had to learn this as a trait and as a skill. How do you, how do you start that process? Because it's one thing to like lay on the ground and be like, I want this over. And it's another thing to listen and honor that and go, you know what? I'm going to push through it anyway. Let me listen to my body. Let me do what I believe I need to do to heal. So how do you start listening to your, to your, not even only intuition, but to the physical responses that you have to stimuli? Yeah. So I think you brought up a good point of how we are generally conditioned to believe that the brain and body are separate. And even up until 20 years ago, we believed in localization in the brain. So each part of the brain had a specific purpose and worked in a specific way. Well, then people were born without half of their brains, but they could still talk and they could still walk. And it looked a little bit different, but they could still do it. And so we started researching how the brain changes and how what happens is if you're born without part of your brain, the brain actually is neuroplastic and can birth new neurons called neurogenesis. And neuroplasticity is something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Our brains are always changing. Listening to this podcast episode is making changes to your brain. Our, ch our brains change within milliseconds, but they form and create new neural pathways over time. And if you strengthen neural pathways through your thoughts and through your actions, it actually creates new neural networks in your brain, which takes about six months to achieve. But it's why you see things like Dr. Tobbs University, where he works with stroke patients who maybe have had, you know, a, a left brain injury, a stroke, and their right arm isn't working properly. And something that he does is this process of incremental training where he actually will bandage up your left arm and have you work on using your right arm day in and day out every single day um, for a certain period of time. And it takes about six months to form those new neural networks in the brain. But eventually the brain fires and wires in a new and different way in order to use that arm again, <laughs> in order to help you thrive. And I think that's the key thing here is that your brain and your body are always trying to protect you. 
they're always trying to help you to survive. You can see it in yourself. You can see it in your pet. I know my dog is always, uh, you know, if he hears a firework, he's on alert because he thinks that there's something dangerous present and he wants to stay alive. And it's just natural for animals to have that survival instinct, that survival response. So I, I will say to kind of then, I, I wanted to mention that, but then to answer your question, Michael, I'll present this in a little bit of a different way because somatic experiencers, uh, somatic therapists, they have a little bit of a different take on this than I do. When I work with somebody, it's typically because they've and, identified- and I'm sorry, but quickly, for those who don't know, can you define somatic, please? I wanna make sure people don't have this go over their head. Sure, yeah. So somatic is basically um, people who are able to, well, somatic in general just refers to the body. So how emotions show up in the body, how trauma is stored in the body. And somatic practitioners can kind of help walk you through this process of, where does that emotion feel? Where do you feel that in your body and help you to process it in that way? Um, so it can be like a really wonderful modality for people who have that stored trauma, maybe as a result of, uh, you know, a psychological traumatic experience, a mental emotional trauma, these types of things, and can help you work through processing that. So my training is a little bit different. When I start working with somebody, it's typically because their nervous system is so dysregulated. They are in that chronic state of fight or flight. And a couple ways you can identify that yourself if you're in that is if your heart beats really fast, um, randomly, if you notice that you breathe fast, if you have inflammation that comes and goes, pain that comes and goes, if you experience food sensitivities, but you've, you know, weeded out all the foods and you're eating healthy and you're gluten free, dairy free, all of these things, and you're still having food sensitivities, um, you get random rashes, you experience um, chemical sensitivities or your sensitivity to um, uh, EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies. So these are all just kind of indicators that, ooh, maybe my autonomic nervous system is dysregulated. Now at that point, the, the way that I kind of have a different spin on things and what I do is so niched is that we can no longer listen to the signals <laughs> that the brain is telling the body. So if you want to, I'll explain a little bit of the, the neuroscience behind that. Um, if that yeah, sounds absolutely because I'm 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 fascinated by this and and I, I would love you to explain the science behind it and then also I, I assume this is gonna happen, move into understanding how you start to reframe around this. Sure, sure. Yeah. So those are good things to be aware of, right? If maybe you're kind of in that state of a chronic fight or flight response. Uh, the next thing I'll point out is the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary uh, adrenal axis. And basically what happens is you can detox. You can do all the things to treat the condition, the POTS, the Lyme disease, whatever you're dealing with to make you feel better, do the, uh, change the diet, right? Change your lifestyle and then still be symptomatic. And it's kind of this result of your brain communicating to your body, dangerous present, dangerous present, dangerous present. And it goes back to, um, you know, our, our past experiences of at one point being in danger, but the brain can get stuck in a state of fight or flight. So that even if you remove the initial threat, the virus, the bacteria, the abusive situation that you were in, the brain can still be communicating to the body that that threat is present and we're going to respond. So the hypothalamus is located in your limbic brain, that feeling and emotional and reacting brain. And the hypothalamus basically communicates to the pituitary gland, which is very you know, responsible for releasing hormones to the rest of your body. And the hypothalamus says, hey, dangerous present, we need to respond. 
and the pituitary gland says, oh my goodness, dangerous present, <laughs> ah, respond. And then the pituitary gland sends a message uh, to the adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys. And that's through ACTH, the adrenocorticotrophin ACT hormone. And the adrenal glands say, oh yeah, 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 there's danger present. We got this message from the pituitary gland. We need to respond. So adrenaline is released, cortisol is released, norepinephrine is released as a response of this communicated signal. So again, we go back to the start of this. The threat doesn't necessarily have to be present for the brain to be in this negative feedback loop that the threat is present and we need to respond and this is dangerous. So that's kind of an interesting thing because a lot of times we think, okay, you know, the very first thing to think about if you have those chronic symptoms is what's going on in my life? You know, how can I eat better, do better, um, feel better, address any virus, address any bacteria? Well, now fast forward to this place where we've done those things and we've detoxed the best that we can and we treated the issues that we have but my body is still symptomatic. My brain is still responding in this threat response. And, and that to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, this, when I found that out, that was such an aha moment for me because I'm like, oh, this is part of my brain. This is my autonomic nervous system responding to a threat. It's not because of a certain condition, though it's important, I wanna stress that it is important to address the virus, the bacteria, all of these things. But when you set your physical body up for success and your autonomic nervous system is still responding, like there's danger present, ah, that's a dysregulated nervous system. And then we can take time to pay attention to that dysregulation and then shift it. And so that's what I teach in vital side. And so, you know, I give tips all of the time just on my Instagram and um, about ways to kind of shift out of this fight or flight response. And I can go through a couple ways to do that now. But I also will say that though I kind of go through on my Instagram, some very quick tips that you can use in the moment to shift out of that fight or flight response there is this sort of structured, pretty intensive approach to making those long-term sustainable changes to your nervous system. Because think about all of the experiences that brought you to this dysregulated autonomic nervous system, the chronic illness, maybe the trauma from your childhood and experiencing abuse as a child, the little T traumas throughout your life, you know, those times where you got called out in class and you didn't know the answer and, you know, you felt uh, traumatized in that moment, right? So trauma, there could be the physical trauma, mental, emotional, psychological trauma, and all of those experiences have led you to this point where the body's like, I just can't handle it anymore. Now I'm symptomatic. So it does take a strategic and structured approach to shifting that. Um, and, and it does take a minimum of, of six months. That's pretty much what I've seen in my own practice and just working with other practitioners who do something similar. But you can daily make these changes and those consistent changes through mental exercises, through visualization techniques, through shifting, becoming aware of certain thoughts and actions you take, habits you have and shifting them. It's all about those incremental changes every single day to then create habits around those new positive changes, how you can benefit your immune system, your health, change your brain for the better, and then making it a sustainable practice. Yeah, I, I love that. And I am such a proponent of this. I, I tell every one of my clients, I talk about on the podcast all the time, 
in order to get to where you want to go, you have to first understand how you got to where you are. And I believe that we are the sum total of all of our experiences leading up to this moment. And so to discount or negate any of those would be dismissive to your own experience because the, even though we don't want them to, all of the things that we've ever experienced in our life play a role in the moment that we're in today. And, and I'm such a huge proponent of this idea of these small, incremental, granular, microscopic shifts that ultimately over time build momentum. And I think about that like this, all of this action, all this movement, all the things to create the change in your life that you want to have starts with your mind and the way that you're thinking about it. Because what you think becomes what you speak and what you speak become your action and your action on a long enough timeline becomes your reality. And here's what I want people to understand and not to misconstrue this or a misnomer that even at three months or six months or even a year, depending on what's happened in your life, that you'll magically be better. This is a process. This takes time. There are things that you must do, dare I say, ad nauseum to the point in which they become habitual in a way that they are now autonomic. So one of the things that I would love for you to talk about is if you are in this place, you're noticing, so I'm doing all the things. I've done all the things. I've gone to therapy. I got my trauma coach. I've, I've read all the books. I've done the healing. My body feels better to an extent, but I still am symptomatic. And suddenly, next thing you know, poof, I've re I feel like I've regressed and I'm back to where I was six months ago, blah, 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 right? You know this story. We've heard it. Someone listening right now is in that place. We're like, damn, I've done all the things. What am I supposed to do next? Where do you actually start? What's a practical tip starting point for someone where they are in this place where they feel like they've tried everything, but they're still symptomatic? Where do they begin? Yeah. The very first step is you have never tried everything. And I know it sucks to hear that because you feel like you have and you're like, no, I'm at my wits end. This is the last thing. There's always more. There's always another method, a different modality, another practitioner that will offer you something, a different approach. So that is just really, it's just inspiring because I've been there feeling like I've done everything. And when I was there, and I had extended all of the resources I knew through my medical training, through the, uh, you know, practitioners that I knew. And I went through that and found that I was still symptomatic. It was horrifying to, to think like, OK, but I don't know what else is there. So it helps to be your own advocate and to know that even if you feel like you're at your wits end and you feel like you've done all of the things. I've been in EMDR for three years and I've also read all of the books and I've also addressed all of the root causes and I've been on this diet and I've had bone broth for two weeks. And I say all those things because I did a handful or I've done all of them, but that was kind of like, you know, what I experienced, what I went through. And it's so true that you haven't done all of the things. There is more for you because there's gonna be someone else out there who has another version of maybe some of the things that you've learned and it is going to present itself to you in the right way at the right time because that's kind of what happens in this healing process. You seek, you seek, and you seek and you find the connections, the people, the modalities that work for you. But if you're here today and you've, you're also like, okay, I've, I'm having this aha moment. That's exactly where I am. I've plateaued in how I feel and it sucks. Um, the first thing to remember is, yeah, that suckiness, you can take note of it and totally understand that it does suck. That being said, if you stay in that pattern of, of feeling like things suck, the rest of your thoughts, the neural pathways that you take will start to recognize, okay, we're in a pattern of stuck and, and suck. <laughs> and we'll just kind of continue in that pathway again and again and again. So if you're feeling that way today, the first piece of advice would be awareness of that state and awareness of where you are. The second piece here would be Break and change your state. Uh, break and change your daily patterns. 
yes, maybe you've been doing all of the things, the EMDR, the seeing of the practitioners and doing them a certain way. And now you're at this point where you've plateaued. You have to do something entirely different. So one of the very first things that you can do is if you've been in this house and you've been recovering for a couple of years and you've been in this house and doing these same, going to these same appointments, rearrange your house entirely. Rearrange the furniture, give it a new paint job, different colors, go through your closet, get rid of those old sick clothes that you've been wearing, even if they're super comfy, get some new ones, have new colors. Bright colors can stimulate joy and vibrancy, even if you're not feeling that right now. Change your environment, and that does change your internal environment. That's something very tangible that you can do, and I know a lot of people will say, well, but I, like my apartment is 800 square feet. I can't really do that. Yes, you can. You can take off that picture on the wall that you've been looking at day in and day out and waking up after an insomnia night and looking at the picture and saying, oh, another day, break the pattern, change the painting, throw it away, put it on another wall, do something entirely different. And then that's some, like a very first easy step that you can take. I guess that was my step two, the awareness was step one. And then step three is these the incidental training, calling yourself out throughout the day when you notice yourself going down the pattern of stuck, sick, suckiness, symptomatic, whatever it is that you're experiencing. And an easy way to do this is setting a timer on your phone. I say like a sweet timer rather than a very jarring timer, maybe like a wind chime or a little bell that goes off maybe once, twice, three times a day. And when it goes off, just stop. What am I thinking about? Is this beneficial? Or is this causing that negative feedback loop of stress and feeding that negative feedback loop. We want to do everything we possibly can to break that negative feedback loop and gain evidence for change. So simply changing your environment can do that. Oh, it's breaking a pattern. Oh, I'm not experiencing life in the same way as I was yesterday. Okay, that's a pattern breaker, a state changer. Well, the third thing you can do is active neuroplasticity, which is what I teach. And so that's breaking your thought cycle, breaking that negative feedback loop. So in the moment, maybe you're at your computer and you're working and you're like, oh, I'm stuck, I'm sick. Or you get that email and you're like, email from your boss and you're like, oh, what is that? Oh my gosh, like, I don't know what to do. Like, that's freaking me out. I'm getting anxious. Get up, walk outside, <laughs> uh, get up put a song on your phone and dance it out for a minute. Uh, something that I'm a big fan of is just through movement changing your state. So shaking your hands out, shaking your arms out, shaking your feet and legs out, even sitting at your desk, shaking your face out. One of my favorite like go-tos in the moment is blowing your lips out. <laughs> and going as long as you possibly can. And something that's really cool about that is specifically the lips is that stimulates facial muscles, which can stimulate the vagus nerve, which is the longest cranial nerve. It's the 10th cranial nerve that connects from your brainstem all the way to your belly and it innervates all these organs in between. And when you stimulate that vagus nerve, it actually sends a message to the brain that you are safe, that you are okay in this moment. So anything to stimulate that, gargling can stimulate that, humming happy birthday twice through can stimulate that. Um, I'm a very physical kinesthetic learner, if you can't tell with the way that I use my hands. So I like to incorporate an immersive experience, any sort of bodily movement that I can use, um, you know, being able to stimulate that vagus nerve and visualization techniques can be extremely helpful as well. But those first three steps are just ways to keep in mind that awareness, um, changing of your environment, breaking your pattern through your external environment. And number three is those incidental training tools, recognizing that you're having that old belief pattern or you're having that uh, symptom in the moment and being able to shift and change and break your state.
I love it. That That is all. And it's incredibly practical, too. I, I say all the time, this journey always starts with awareness. Everything that you're going to do in your life starts with making meaning and notice of it. And and that's such such practical advice. And the other thing, and you didn't say it, but I'm going to pinpoint it, is looking at this from the perspective of being solution oriented. So often we're trapped in this idea of only ever looking for the negative, looking for the bad, looking for where we're stuck, looking for why we can't. And I'm over here like, how can we do this shit? Like the only thing I'm ever thinking about is like, what is the solution? Not giving up, knowing and understanding that it literally might be the 37th thing that you try that becomes the solution that you're looking for. And it might take you 10 years. But my thought is like, I'm going to do it anyway. So I would love people, Unbroken Nation, take this with you today. Like, think about solutions. My friend, before I ask you my last question, and I could talk to you, I feel like we were just starting to get in the crux of this. But before I ask you my last question today, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Sure. So you can find me on Instagram at my vital side. I have a lot of free content, free tips there. You can also find me on my website, vital-side.com. You can find a lot of great resources, programs, all that on there. And then I also have a podcast, Rewire the Podcast, where we talk all things rewiring the brain to better our health and, you know, really help us to live a life full of purpose. Thank you so much. And Unbroken Nation, we'll put all that information in the show notes. Lindsay, my last question for you, my friend, is what does it mean to you to be unbroken? Unbroken to me doesn't mean never feeling broken. Being unbroken to me means during those tough times, those crappy times, those times where we do feel broken, showing up anyway, and tapping in to our natural resilience. And I've had clients, I, I just know so many people who have had these terrible stories of living with a chronic condition, chronic symptoms, being able to then focus and shift their mindset, focus and regulate their nervous system to tap into their natural resilience. And it's muscle memory. The more that we're able to tap into our natural resilience, our brain's very own healing properties, the more we're able to access this again and again and again. Life situations are always gonna happen traumatic events, loss of friends, family members, pandemics, these types of things are inevitable as part of our human experience. Being unbroken is when you can show up to those experiences with that built resilience in your brain, in your body, and be there and feel that resilience, tap into that being able to show up in a way that maybe doesn't always feel the best, doesn't always feel strong, can make you feel vulnerable, but that's also part of being unbroken. That's also part of that resilience pathway. I literally have goosebumps right now. You are speaking <laughs> my language. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for being here, listening. Please, as usual, like, subscribe, comment, review, tell a friend, and until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya.